Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with Plato's Republic. So as always, we are using the Loeb edition. <clears throat> Excuse me. So losing my voice here. Uh, we're using the Loeb edition, and this is the Paul Shorey translation. And also, as always, for those of you watching this on my YouTube channel, there is a PDF link in the description box. Um, so um, we'll go into some bit of review. We have just a little bit to review here. We started talking about democracy last week. We did only the first section, though. So just a quick review of that, and then we'll jump into the second section. So we saw, if you're looking at uh, page 279, and this is uh, 555C, for those of you with a different translation, um, in the PDF, so many ways to uh, explain where we are, but in the PDF, it's 352. That's the screen page, but it's page 279 in the book. 555C is the Stephanus number. And here what we see is that the honoring of wealth is incompatible with a sober and temperate citizenship. So that's in the language, of course, of the city-state. But looking to the soul, we see that that means that this person then is lacking in temperance. And, and this lack of temperance is what allows this transition from the um, from the oligarchy to the democracy. And showing here that um, the honoring of wealth, which is the mark of the oligarchy, is incompatible with a temperate soul. So there's a lack of sophrosyn there. And then we're seeing that in this soul, then what happens, so this is again that transition from oligarchy to democracy. We see that there's um, greater, the Basically, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And then the poor then are described as being like drones with stings. Um, jumping a little ahead here on the next page, we see that the rulers and their offspring, and let me see here where I am. Uh, yeah, this is uh, five... 55, I'm sorry, 556C. And uh, the rulers and their offspring, then they have a lack of courage. So whereas that lack of temperance was the mark of the oligarchy, he's saying a lack of courage is the mark of democracy. So they're too soft to stand up against pleasure and pain, and they become mere idlers. Okay. And then there's this long story here. I didn't highlight too much here because it's a long story, but of the, they're all on the march, the, the rich and the poor marching together, and the poor recognize that the rich are kind of flabby and out of shape. They haven't been doing manual labor the way the working class and the working poor have been doing. And they conclude that these rulers, they only keep their wealth by the cowardice of the poor. And that brought us to the conclusion on the next page. And here we're looking at uh, 557A. That democracy comes into being when the poor overthrow the rulers. And we see that everybody is equal in their citizenship and offices. And the offices are, for the most part, assigned by lot. So it's not a meritocracy. It's just, it's just random. Okay, and so there's a lot given there, but it hasn't quite been unfolded for us. We can guess a lot and fill in the blanks, but we want to see how he's going to unfold it. Okay, so this is where we're going to pick it up. Any uh, questions or thoughts before we jump into the text? Yeah, I was thinking about this. Um, we've got the wisdom level of the aristocratic that falls because maybe wasn't doing justice and addressing the injustices. Um, and then we have the timocratic 
which still has a principle of wisdom but has mm -hmm. to fight for it is sort of tumultuous is, mm -hmm. is not unified within itself has to put effort and use that spirited part to fight for it but it has all these problems mm -hmm. and then the old archic so so but then uh that's kind of like courage without wisdom whereas the other one was wisdom without justice and then the next one down the oligarchic doesn't even have that honor part of it and is the lack of temperance kind of thing doesn't mm -hmm. have it uh so it's kind of like the the state characterized by temperance or a lack of but what we looked at last time was it still has the principle it still is aware of a principle mm -hmm. like democratic or courage is aware of wisdom and and temperance is aware that there is a uh, wisdom there is a principle mm -hmm. it's just not doing it mm -hmm. so here seems like those top three this fourth one democracy seems like it might be the fall in which there isn't a principle anymore You've, you've lost the principle. It's just not on the table anymore. Mm. Whereas those three are kind of at odds in various ways with the principle. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say too much about democracy since we are going to read about it today. So we'll hold on to that. That's, uh, that, that's a good thought of where we're going. But yes, yeah, certainly we do see um, with temperance, they're still trying to hold on to wisdom and there's the fight. And we also saw in the case of um, temp, or I'm sorry, wisdom. Yet, yeah, so with the democracy dealing with wisdom, they're trying to hold on to it. And we saw also with the oligarchy that even though they do lack temperance, they have that sort of twisted notion of temperance, where you have to repress the unhealthy. Yeah, so that fits what you're saying very much. Yeah, so that's definitely there. And so we can look in democracy if it's either a complete lack of, it's either a either it's the collapse of any value, or are they holding on to some notion of courage? Oh, That's twisted. That. It would be one I or the that. other. It'll be one way or the other. But without yes, knowing. I love uh -huh. oh, sorry, go ahead. The, the idea of twisted. Mm -hmm. um, I love this because like democracy does have a spirit of part. Mm -hmm. So it is courage, but it's a twisted courage. It's not quite unified within itself. And well, the oligarchic is a twisted mm -hmm. idea of temperance. But then you could also mm -hmm. maybe extrapolate to the aristocratic. It has wisdom, but it's a little bit twisted because wisdom isn't wisdom unless you're putting words on injustice, which is above wisdom, that fourth virtue. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of wisdom, but maybe slightly, slightly twisted. Not, so as, he's like presenting idea. It. Not as he's presenting it. That's your. That's the well, book you're I mean, going to write. If it wasn't uh -huh. twisted in some way, he would have been able to maintain his wisdom. Well, this is we're talking about the person who falls. Yes. Yes. yes the person mm -hmm. who falls mm -hmm. doesn't have pure wisdom has that twisted. And mm -hmm. the reason why I said it lacks a principle in democracy, mm -hmm. even though we haven't gone on, is because they they're just choosing lots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No real principle between right. choosing mm -hmm. lots. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I yeah I see where you're coming from, and I think that's a intelligent guess of where it's going. So there's logically there are those two possibilities. I think that what you said is a perfectly logical possibility. And is there another twist of the very virtue that is lacking here? So it's going to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going <coughs> excuse me, uh, going forward, we're looking at section eleven. So, same reading parts? Okay. Okay. Sure. Great. So, whenever you're ready. So, as Socrates, yes. what then is the manner of their life? And what is the quality of such a constitution? For it is plain that the man of this quality will turn out to be a democratic sort of man. It is plain. To begin with, are they not free? And is it's not the not... city chock? What? Sorry, is that Socrates? I think that's Socrates. Mm. Sorry, it is with. plain as all I said. Mm. Uh, yeah. To begin with, are they not free? And is not the city chock full of liberty and freedom of speech? 
and has not every man license to do as he likes? So it is said. And where there is such a license, it is obvious that everyone would arrange a plan for leading his own life in the way that pleases him. Obvious. All sorts and conditions of men, then, would arise in this polity more than in any other? Of course. Possibly this is the most beautiful of polities, as a garment of many colors embroidered with all kinds of hues, so this, decked and diversified with every type of character, would appear the most beautiful. And perhaps many would judge it to be the most beautiful, like boys and women, when they see bright colored things. Yes, indeed, women be like that. And boys. <laughs> and boys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it is the fit place, my good friend, in which to look for a constitution. Why so? Because, owing to this license, it includes all kinds, and it seems likely that anyone who wishes to organize a state as we were just now doing, must find his way to a democratic city and select the model that pleases him, as if in a bazaar of constitutions, and after making his choice, establish his own. Perhaps at any rate, he would not be at a loss for patterns. And the freedom from all compulsion to hold office in such a city, even if you are qualified, or again, to submit to rule unless you please, or to make war when the rest are at war, or to keep the peace when others do so, unless you desire, and again, the liberty in defiance of any law that forbids you to hold office and sit on juries, nonetheless, if it occurs to you to do so, is not all that a heavenly and delicious entertainment for the time being? Perhaps, uh, for so long. And is not the placeability of some convicted criminals exquisite? Or have you never seen in such a state men condemned to death or exile who nonetheless stay on? and go to and fro among the people, as if no one saw or heeded him. The man slips in and out like a revenant. Yes, many. And the tolerance of democracy, its superiority to all our meticulous requirements, its disdain for our solemn pronouncements made when we were founding our city, that except in the case of transcendent natural gifts, no one could ever become a, go a good man unless from childhood his play and all his pursuits were concerned with things fair and good. How superbly it tramples underfoot all such ideals, caring nothing from what practices and way of life a man turns to politics, but honoring him if only he says that he loves the people. Uh, it is a noble polity indeed. These and qualities akin to these democracy would exhibit and it would, it seems, be a delightful form of government. An anarchic, anarchic, and motley Anarchy. assigning, mm -hmm. an arctic, yeah, mm -hmm. and motley assigning a kind of equality indiscriminately to equals and unequals alike. <laughs> yes, everybody knows that. Okay, so anarchic motley crew. Yeah. 
being a little sarcastic here. Uh, let's go back and see what they're saying about this democracy. Um, okay, so this constitution then would create the democratic sort of man. And it's a city chock full of liberty and freedom of speech. Okay, so again, carrying on that idea from the, from the end of the last section, that everybody is equal, everybody just does what they want, and they take lots and, and so on. Um, every man has license to do as he likes. And everyone would arrange a plan for leading his own life the way that pleases him. And so we're going to see how this differs from the aristocratic, right? Because that's what we're, that's the ideal that we're holding it up against. Um, and now there are also, there's a lot of description here of being very colorful and diverse and all sorts and conditions of people. What is the significance from the perspective of the soul, from what we saw about the virtues and the healthy soul? What is the significance of this? Possibly just too many ideas, not filtering out mm -hmm. the ideas, just a kind of okay. being mm -hmm. a busybody, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How does this contrast with the healthy condition of soul? What was the mark of the healthy soul in contrast to this? Each part doing its own thing. Okay, yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. That's certainly the definition of justice, that each part is doing its own proper job, right? And so we're not seeing that here. Uh, what else is the mark? And Jed, you want to jump in here? What is what else is the mark that would be a contrast to this diversity? Hmm. The harmony within the parts in in the true virtue is directed towards something that exists in being, mm -hmm. whereas here he's looking at shapes and colors that boys and women like, and and picking from physical examples that mm -hmm. you see around us mm -hmm. there's no guiding principle and mm -hmm. by principle i mean having an, a, a selfhood existing in being mm. okay yeah well there's certainly there seem to be um guided by their whims or their desires and so that would be the lowest part of the soul yeah i was actually <coughs> excuse me aiming for something even um more basic to what we saw of the soul, but that it's one, the idea of it being a unity, that all the parts function together into a unity, whereas here there's a great diversity, so that's the opposite extreme, right? Mm. Yeah, but yeah. but then, mm -hmm. like you said, it's not interesting and dramatic and gossipy mm -hmm. unless there's mm -hmm. drama and people going against the grain mm -hmm. and every dramatic TV show, it's right. it, there has to be conflict, mm -hmm. so, uh, interesting for a while he said mm -hmm. right yes we don't have a we don't have a, a long attention spans um at the bottom of the page here where they talk about that you can select the model that pleases you it's a, as if in a bazaar of constitutions right so again that idea of great diversity and eddie montes replies that uh, he would not be at a loss for patterns. And just as kind of a side note here, the Greek word for pattern is paradigm, paradigmia or something, I forget how to pronounce it exactly, but it's the same word for pattern as when Plato was describing the pattern in the soul at the very beginning of book six that you must hold on to, hold on to that pattern in the soul and let that guide you. Um, Socrates does not use that word when he says select the model, but Adimantus does use that word, that there's lots of paradigms out there. So they're kind of making them all equal, right? Um, and another evidence mm. of his not being mm. at Socrates' ability, because he thinks mm. paradigms can be physical things, mm. whereas Socrates isn't using it, he knows yeah. paradigms. Or at least it's being. just a concept 
and you can have many of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can just do whatever you want. He's saying here, um, you don't have to hold office, even if you're qualified. Um, you don't even have to submit to rule um, unless you please or make war when the rest are at war. Do whatever you want. Um, and it's and then they use lots of colorful and positive sounding words, but in a um, ironic sort of way, or they're being a little sarcastic here. Um, <laughs> we have a few words that maybe it seemed we didn't know here. Um, placability, by the way, is like stubbornness, but like about like holding on to a negative feeling. Um, that some convicted criminals are very stubborn, they hold on. Um, they're condemned to death or exile, but they still just hang out and they go around with the people as if uh, nothing was wrong. And they move in and out like ghosts or revenants is basically like a ghost. And um, but because democracy is very tolerant. And the solemn, and this part here, I think, is significant. The tolerance of democracy, its superiority to all of our meticulous requirements, and its disdain for our solemn pronouncements made when we were founding our city. So there, do you see that Socrates is contrasting the democracy with the healthy soul? And Jacob, you're nodding there. Can you say a little bit more about that comparison he's making? Yeah, mm -hmm. he is being ironic because mm -hmm. in the ideal soul, there is rules that kind of govern things, mm -hmm. whereas in this democracy, there they just kind of go with the flow, let people do what they want. Mm -hmm. That idea of like liberty and uh, it's seen in comparison then it seems the uh, ordered soul has mm -hmm. more complicated structures that would be harder mm -hmm. to maintain. Mm. Okay. Yeah. The healthy soul has meticulous requirements. What would be the significance of having meticulous requirements? Well, it helps people to work together with, you know, laws mm -hmm. or, or rules that... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's harder. It's hard to find the truth, but once mm -hmm. you find it, it should be kind of codified into mm -hmm. uh, society. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have <laughs> that, then getting it seems hard. Mm -hmm. Hard to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he is being sarcastic and calling it meticulous because maybe that's the perspective of the person from the democratic um, state of mind that they think their system is superior. Theirs has a superiority, but, you know, those are those aristocratic souls, they're, they're nitpicky and they have lots of s silly little rules that have no meaning, right? But we saw that there's a reason for the proper, there's a proper order and there's a reason for it, right? And also, um, it has a disdain. The democracy has a disdain for our solemn pronouncements made when we are founding our city. That except in the case of transcendent natural gifts, no one could ever become a good man unless from childhood his play and all of his pursuits were concerned with things fair and good. But the democracy just tramples on that. Okay. Right. So again, Socrates laid out a reason for this. Right. And we, when we were looking at the earlier sections, we talked about this in great length. Um, the need to focus on what is fair and good as like a foundation right, for our studies. But the democracy tosses that out. Oh, sorry, Jed, were you about to say something? I was just thinking about what you said about. Mm -hmm how it appears meticulous from the outside mm -hmm. which seems to be a criticism level against philosophers mm -hmm. if and i think it's another example of the difference between the physical world focus and the metaphysical 
if you have your idea on the metaphysical paradigm, it's just a singular focus. It's just a one. It's the less ma least meticulous. But if all people realize, if all people can see is how you physically act, then it will seem like there is all this meticulousness, meticulousness, because they don't realize that this is just the natural overflowing of a singularly focused, least meticulous soul. Very unappealing to someone who only knows the physical world. And freedom, or libertarianism, or freedom mm -hmm. is to be able to do whatever you want in the physical world. Mm -hmm. And with the freedom to do that without realizing... And I think this goes back to right to the beginning of our, our text when we saw that there is a kind of effort or discipline or practice in the virtues to begin with, which might seem meticulous, but for a good reason to become that singular focus on being so that it becomes integrated into your being so you're in that flow state mm -hmm. where it's literally without any thinking or planning to act with the full mm -hmm. force of your being. Mm -hmm. So two problems with that that are very illuminating of the difference between Socrates and Adimantos or a philosopher and us regular folk. We have to be aware that what seems meticulous is only a byproduct of our physical perception only, but also if we only have a physical perception, we lack the reason for being meticulous. We are stoics, meticulous for meticulous sake. If we realize there is a principle in being that is closer to self and reality that we can gain, it is actually an evolution of consciousness or a spiritual thing, then there's a good reason for being meticulous. Mm -hmm. So we're not being chastised for being boring meticulous for meticulous mm -hmm. sake, or even um, exemplifying mm -hmm. that as stoic for being you know, tough for toughness sake, we realize, no, no, there is a principle and it's mm -hmm. awesome. It's beauty itself. It's justice mm -hmm. itself that you can organize your entire being around. Mm -hmm. And all of that only comes to light when you acknowledge that there is a realm of being. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And to bring it back into the book more, um, remember that this democratic person grew out of the oligarchic, the oligarchic lacks temperance and only understands temperance as the repressing of the worst desires. And so they don't, this person does not understand what temperance truly is. And so this person looks at someone who, whose desires naturally fall in line with what is healthy. And they think this person is just repressing a lot of desires. And it's in that sense also that they're being meticulous and they look stoical as you put it mm -hmm. yeah yeah like mm -hmm. like um tr having coffee with your philosopher friend and trying to gossip and they're like oh I'm, i don't want to talk about gossip mm -hmm. oh you're so meticulous and stoic you, <laughs> isn't the drama of of people not being unified this. and in conflict isn't that mm -hmm. gossip interesting like well no not really not when you've seen through it all <laughs> yeah well, yeah, I don't know if that's a definition of meticulous, but yeah, yeah, but that's, yeah, they have a different way of seeing the world. Yeah. And they look at this philosopher as being yeah, too serious and too rigid in their ways of being. They don't understand it. Um, yeah, you're meticulous in like mm -hmm. in how you're repressing mm -hmm. yourself. Like, oh, mm -hmm. you, you can't talk about mm -hmm. that. You can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just not interested once I've mm. seen that you are just a democratic mm. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, these qualities akin to these democracy would exhibit, and it would, it seems, be a delightful form of government. So again, delightful there being used in a sarcastic way because it's like an anarchy and it's just motley. And, um, it's a kind of equality indiscriminately to equals and unequals alike. Right, so again, there's no rhyme or reason, there's no principle that's guiding who's ruling and who isn't. Right, they're just, as Jed was saying earlier, they're just kind of uh, ruled by their whims. And whichever, wherever the wind blows, that's what's ruling them that day. 
So um, before I say more about that, I think we should go on because there's going to there's quite a bit more to unfold here. There's a lot because it is so diverse and colorful. It means there's quite a bit to say about it. And so it'll come into more focus, I think, as we go on. There were two okay. things that we skipped over. Okay. There was mm -hmm. the one where there's someone who goes to prison, but then he comes back out and he walks among the people mm -hmm. as though he's a hero. Mm. That's a weird thing. And then there's the thing of, like, hero. oh, and you, um, you don't have to have a... Oh. I'm sorry, where, where were you at? I thought you were talking about this, about the ghost, but not the yeah, ghost. Um, uh. He's, uh, where is it? He goes into prison and then he walks among the people again as though he's a hero. Where's that? Have you never seen such a state men condemned to death or exile? who nonetheless yeah. stay on and go to and fro among the people as if no one saw or heeded him. The man slips in and out like a revenant, which is a, like a ghost yeah. or a dead person. Mm. Oh, I see. Mm. see in the uh, Balboa, it says as if he's a returning hero. Ah, uh, maybe he meant that in the um, sense of mythology. The heroes reach oh, okay. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure why, why that translation. No, it, it's at least that's not this translation. I'm not sure. No, I don't know the Greek. Mm. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and so the people who ask. yeah, he claims that this is a better interpret. He, the the author feels that's a better interpretation mm -hmm. than interpreting that Greek word to mean mm -hmm. a hero. Ah, yeah, there, sorry, there is a footnote. Yes. His being unnoticed accords better with the rendering spirit, or one returned from the dead, than with that of a hero returning from the wars. Okay, so maybe the Greek is something more like hero. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, you, you've escaped the, you've gotten, you've gotten away with it. Mm -hmm. If you can pursue your desires and get in the yes. way with it, which is a very mm -hmm. common idea of, of justice, of mm -hmm. virtue, to be mm -hmm. able to get away with whatever you mm -hmm. want. And also the last part where he says, um, uh, you don't have to do anything so long as you say, say that you are a, a champion of the working class. Mm -hmm. You're a champion. For, I care about, oh, I care so deeply about you people. So can I just be exploiting of you? Mm. That's very yes. familiar. Mm. Pretty much all yes. they say is mm -hmm. this now in a democracy. Mm. I love the people. I love unions. I'm the working class. I'm yes. blue collar. Mm. That's all that they're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I want to come back to that first point that you made. That is something worth commenting on. Because whether it is a person who's just walking like the among the dead or it's somebody who comes back as a hero, either way, the idea of getting away with it, doing wrong and getting away with it, that's very much at the root of the very question that Socrates is addressing. Remember, he was given those two ideal people, those two extremes, someone who's pure good, but is treated as though they're unjust, and then someone who's completely unjust, but gets away with it and is seen as the hero, right? So this is exactly the person that what he's describing here in this one sentence is exactly the person that he's told he's challenged to say is not the ideal. This is what many in society hold as the ideal. And he's showing why the other person is actually the one that we would prefer to be. Yeah, and I completely mm -hmm. understand it too. Like mm -hmm. there was a, there's a football player in Australia who came out to talk about mm -hmm. his exploits while he was a champion mm -hmm. Australian football player. And he, his thing was like, well... I was the best football player, mm -hmm. but then between the break, I did all these lecherous things and I went on like week long benders. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's amazing and, and terrible. All of the comments mm -hmm. was, he's a champion. He's an Australian champion. He's mm -hmm. the best. Mm -hmm. He got away with it. Mm -hmm. He did all those things we would all do yeah. if we had the money, mm -hmm. all these let pursuing all of our desires mm -hmm. and didn't get punished for it. And again, without an understanding that there is a principle and a reality higher than your physical pleasures, it completely makes sense. And mm -hmm. so reading this, I, I have more empathy for those commenters saying, he's a hero for getting away with the, the way that we would all act if we could, mm -hmm. if we were that rich and famous. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, let's go on now to section 12. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Let's go on now to section 12 and get a little bit more of the, a um, little more meat on the bones here, a little more of the details of it all. So when you're ready. Okay. Observe then the corresponding private character. Or must we first, as in the case of the polity, consider the origin of the type? Yes. Is not this, then, the way of it? Our thrifty oligarchical man would have his son bred in his father's ways. Why not? And he, too, would control by force all his appetites for pleasure that are wasters and not winners of wealth, those which are denominated unnecessary. Obviously. And, in order not to argue in the dark, shall we first define our distinction between necessary and unnecessary appetites? Let us do so. Well, then, desires that we cannot divert or suppress may be properly called necessary, and likewise those whose satisfaction is beneficial to us, may they not? For our nature compels us to seek their satisfaction. Is not that so? Most assuredly. Then we shall rightly use the word necessary of them. Rightly. And what of the desires from which a man could free himself by discipline from youth up? and whose presence in the soul does no good, and in some cases harm, should we not fairly call all such unnecessary? Fairly indeed. Let us select an example of either kind, so that we may apprehend the type. Let us do so. Would not the desire of eating to keep in health and condition and the appetite for mere bread and relishes be necessary? I think so. The appetite for bread is necessary in both respects, in that it is beneficial, and in that if it fails, we die. Hmm, yes. And the desire for relishes, so far as it conduces to fitness? By all means. And should we not rightly pr pronounce unnecessary the appetite that exceeds these, and seeks other varieties of food, and that by correction and training from youth up can be got rid of in most cases, and is harmful to the body, and a hindrance to the soul's attainment of intelligence and sobriety? Bookies. Nay, most rightly. And may we not call the one group the spendthrift desires, and the other the profitable, because they help production? Surely. And we shall say the same of sexual and other appetites? The same. And were we not saying that the man whom we nicknamed the drone is the man who teems with such pleasures and appetites, and who is governed by his unnecessary desires, while one who is ruled by his necessary appetites is the thrifty oligarchical man? Why, surely. Okay. So here we have a little more clarity of the difference between the oligarchic state of mind and what he's calling the democratic state of mind. <clears throat> so we see here that the oligarchic person controls by force any appetites that he deems to be unnecessary. Right, we've been talking a bit at length that he, this person does not understand what temperance truly is and thinks that it means to repress what are seen as the worst desires and to um, prefer the more maybe socially acceptable desires. 
But it's also clear here that for this person, because this person has a twisted sense of what is necessary and unnecessary, this person values anything that makes money. Um, so the what this person sees as unnecessary would be anything that is seen as wasting money, spending money, not winners of wealth. Okay, so that's this person's value. Sorry? Avocado toast, we, we call that nowadays. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so this person is wasting money. Um, so those kind of desires, they get repressed. Anything that makes money is seen as socially acceptable and good. But now we want to get a clear definition of the distinction, our distinction, it's so not to this person's distinction, but our distinction between necessary and unnecessary appetites. So, Jacob, did you get a sense of going through this? Maybe you want to look it over again. But uh, what basically is the difference between the necessary and the unnecessary? The necessary, he said, was the bread and relishes or ju like just... Uh, appeasing the appetites as far as what we need to like survive mm -hmm. and not any more mm -hmm. than that mm -hmm. okay. does that remind you of anything we read earlier in the text yes kind of what i mentioned earlier about justice oh. the mm -hmm. uh, just doing your own bit not mm -hmm. being a busy person. right yeah, so that kind of um, city, when he was describing it in terms of the city, the city fit for pigs, where everybody just does their job and minds their own business. They have what they need, and they're satisfied with it, and they don't want any more. And they're not looking to get any larger. And remember, he also had said about the healthy city that it only grows so large as to remain a unity and no larger. And it's only when you want to bring in the relishes and bring in the extras, make it more colorful and a more fun city. Now you have to expand, and that's when they bring in the idea of war. There's no war before that. Right. Yeah, so then in contrast, what are the unnecessary desires? Towards the bottom of page 293, should we not rightly pronounce unnecessary these appetites? Well, the bread was the necessary mm -hmm. to live, and the mm -hmm. relishes were that were actually beneficial, conducive mm -hmm. to extra fit. Mm -hmm. So we are allowed a, a few relishes in Pig City. Yes. We can have our avocado toast, even, because avocados well, are very no, healthy. That, <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's a good argument to those rich people who blame us for being uh -huh. poor because we all love avocado toast mm -hmm. have some avocado so he says here that um uh, we rightly pronounce unnecessary those appetites that exceed these and seek other varieties of food and that by correction and training from youth up, they can be got rid of. So the kinds of things you want to get rid of when you do the kind of training that's described throughout this book. Um, it's harmful. The unnecessary desires are harmful to the body. And this last part is significant. They're a hindrance to the soul's attainment of phrenesis and sophrosun, or what here is intelligence and sobriety. Okay. So they get in the way of our attaining of wisdom okay so these are that's what he defines as unnecessary desires that's just what mm -hmm. i was that's the theme of what i've been mm -hmm. talking about today mm -hmm. the, the idea of mm -hmm. without an understanding that mm -hmm. there is a paradigm existing in being number one being has to exist number two it can be mm -hmm. integrated into yourself phronesis then mm -hmm. These other states kind of make sense with 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 mm -hmm. that thing lacking, mm -hmm. which seems to be the whole the whole book. Socrates, mm -hmm. can you, if I give you a man who has all of the physical things and can get away with it, can you show that there is a non-physical thing that's e even better? Mm 
mm. that you can have has to exist. So it has to be a realm of being. And number two has to be able to be ha had by you as phronesis. Mm -hmm. And the irony being, thankfully, we, we have an understanding of the Greek and we have the Balboa translations that we have that word phronesis because mm -hmm. that's key because without that, you just have this translation, which has intelligence and sobriety, well, which doesn't necessarily mean that thing that we need to mm -hmm. have the thing we're after. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a bit of a tragic joke that our translator doesn't put in the very words needed to have been put in mm -hmm. to really understand the, the essence of what we're reading here. True, although we do have the Greek as well. But yes, you have to Thankfully. be able to read Greek <laughs> to understand what the word is. Yes. Um, the next sentence that he gives here is, um, I think, a correction of the oligarchic person's definition of necessary and unnecessary. Because remember, we saw, I'm going to just scroll back here for a moment, that for the oligarchic person, the unnecessary desires were those that waste money and not winners of wealth implying that the necessary desires are those that bring money. Well, now, after giving a different definition of necessary and unnecessary, Socrates says, and may we not call the one group the spendthrift desires and the other the profitable because they help production. So a different notion of what it means to be a spendthrift or be wasteful and a different definition of what it means to be profitable. It's not about making money, it's about having a healthy soul. What benefits the healthy soul is profitable. What does not, what harms it or hinders it is what he's calling the spendthrift desires. And the same of sexual and other appetites. Okay, so also just one maybe point out here that Platonists are not Puritans. Um, you remember Socrates had children late into his life, and, um, you know, there's, there's not this idea in Platonism that you have to pull away from society or not be a part of society, that you can't enjoy society. You can have those relishes that of your, with your meal that are not unhealthy for you. Um, you can be married and you can have... Uh, sexual appetite without um, without it being unhealthy right so that's I think why that was thrown in as well that with these other appetites as well there's the healthy version and that which is unhealthy mm. and then he clarifies that the man we nicknamed the drone is the one who teems with such pleasures and appetites either necessary or unnecessary. And then he clarifies um, that it, the democratic person is governed by his unnecessary desires, but the one ruled by his necessary appetites is the oligarchic man, or at least to the degree he understands what it means to be necessary, is his understanding of it. Because we all desire good to the degree we understand it, right? Okay, so um, maybe we have time to do the last section here. I think there's just one more section for oligarchy. And so um, if we go through this last section, then we'll have everything, and then we can really bring it all together. Okay. So when you're ready. To return then, mm -hmm. we have to tell how the democratic man develops from the oligarchical type. I think it is usually in this way. How? Oh. When a youth bred in the illiberal and naggardly fashion that we were describing gets a taste of the honey of the drones and associates with fierce and cunning creatures who know how to purvey pleasures of every kind and variety and condition, there you must doubtless conceive is the beginning of the transformation of the oligarchy 
in his soul into democracy. Quite inevitably. May we not say that just as the revolution in the city was brought about by the aid of an alliance from outside, coming to the support of the similar and corresponding party in the state, so the youth is revolutionized when a like and kindred group of appetites from outside comes to the aid of one of the parties in his soul? By all means. And if, I take it, a counter-alliance comes to the rescue of the oligarchical part of his soul, either it may be from his father or from his other kin, who admonish and reproach him, then there arises faction and counterfaction and internal strife in the man with himself. Surely. And sometimes, I suppose, the democratic element retires before the oligarchical, some of its appetites having been destroyed and others expelled, and a sense of awe and reverence grows up in the young man's soul, and order is restored. That sometimes happens. And sometimes again, another broad of desires, akin to those expelled, are stealthily nurtured to take their place, owing to the father's ignorance of true education, and wax numerous and strong. Yes, that is wont to be the way of it. And they tug and pull back to the same associations, and in secret intercourse engender a multitude. Yes, indeed. And in the end, I suppose they seize the citadel of the young man's soul, finding it empty and unoccupied by studies and honorable pursuits and true discourses which are the best watchmen and guardians in the minds of men who are dear to the gods. Much the best. And then, false and braggart words and opinions charge up the height and take their place and occupy that part of such a youth. They do indeed. And then he returns, does he not, to those lotus eaters, and without disguise, lives openly with them. And if any support comes from his kin to the thrifty element in his soul, those braggart discourses close the gates of the royal fortress within him, and refuse admission to the auxiliary force itself and will not grant audience as to envoys to the words of older friends in private life, and they themselves prevail in the conflict, and naming reverence and awe, folly, thrust it forth, a dishonored fugitive, and temperance they call want of manhood, and banish it with contumately with contumately and they teach that moderation and orderly expenditure mm -hmm. rusticity and illiberality and they combine with a gang of unprofitable and harmful appetites to drive them over the border they do indeed and when they have emptied and purged of all these, the soul of the youth that they have thus possessed and occupied, in whom they are initiating with these magnificent and costly rites, they proceed to lead home from exile, insolence, and anarchy, and prodigality, and shamelessness, resplendent in a great attendant choir, and crowned with garlands, and in celebration of their praises, they euphemistically denominate insolence, 
good breeding, license, liberty, prodigality, magnificence, and shamelessness, manly spirit. And is it not in some such way as this? That in his youth the transformation takes place from the restriction to necessary desires in his education to the liberation and release of his unnecessary and harmful desires. Yes, your description is most vivid. Then, in his subsequent life, I take it, such a one expends money and toil and time no more on his necessary than on his unnecessary pleasure. But if it is his good fortune that the period of storm and stress does not last too long, and as he grows older, the fiercest tumult within him passes, and he receives back a part of the banished elements, and does not abandon himself altogether to the invasion of the others, then he establishes and maintains all his pleasures on a footing of equality, forsooth, and so lives, turning over the guardhouse of his soul to each as it happens along until it is sated, as if it had drawn the lot for that office, and then in turn to another, disdaining none but fostering them all equally. Why so? And he does not accept or admit into the guardhouse the words of truth when anyone tells him that some pleasures arise from honorable and good desires, and others from those that are base, and that we ought to practice and esteem the one and control and subdue the others. But he shakes his head at all such admonitions, and averts that they are all alike and to be equally esteemed. Such is indeed his state of mind and his conduct. And does he not also live out his life in this fashion, day by day, indulging the appetite of the day, now wine-bibbing and abandoning himself to the lascivious, <laughs> lascivious. lascivious, lascivious pleasing of the flute, and again, drinking only water and dieting, and at one time exercising his body, and sometimes idling and neglecting all things, and at another time seeming to occupy himself with philosophy. And frequently he goes in for politics and bounces up, and says and does whatever enters his head, and if military men excite his emulation, Hither he rushes, and if moneyed men, to that he turns, and that there is no order or compulsion in his existence. But he calls this life of his the life of pleasure and freedom and happiness, and cleaves to it to the end. That is a perfect description of a devotee of equality. I certainly think that he is a manifold man, stuffed with most excellent differences, and that, like that city, he is the fair and many-colored one whom many a man and woman would count fortunate in his life, as containing within himself the greatest number of patterns and constitutions and qualities. Yes, that is so. Shall we definitely assert, then, that such a man is to be ranged with democracy, and would properly be designated as democratic? Let that be his place. Okay, so very nice um, imagery he gave us there. So let's go back to the beginning and see if we can go through all of this. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of... Uh, maybe archaic uses of words here, but um, a liberal means, in this case, like uneducated. And uh, this one is stingy. 
so we don't use obviously we don't use the word niggardly anymore um but it would basically just stingy so this person was bred in an uneducated and stingy fashion but then they got a taste of the honey of the drones a nice imagery there they got that got a taste of that honey and now they're discovering that uh, they want to live a whole different way right um and they transform from an oligarchy so raised on raised um by a father who was an oligarchic man and they become democratic and uh part of his soul now oh yeah so then he goes on here to talk about how this person may at least in youth be kind of torn between the two ways of being and if they go with their father's way of being then they'll go back to being oligarchic Okay, so that's described first. Um, either it may be from his father or from his other kin who admonish and reproach him. And then there's some faction and counterfaction, and they may go one way or the other. Um, sometimes the democratic element retires before the oligarchical. It's beaten out, and they're convinced that what their father sees as necessary desires really are better, and that really is a better way to live. And so those um, democratic appetites then are destroyed or they're getting repressed, right? Because the oligarchic is repressing a lot. And order is restored. And that does sometimes happen. But then again, it may happen that these other desire, desires will continue to get nurtured. And why? Owing to the father's ignorance of true education. What is that what is that pointing to? Any ideas? So the father, remember, is following oh, I'm sorry, did you have an idea, Jacob? Okay. Um the no, father, remember, is the oligarchic soul. When we're dealing with the oligarchy, are we dealing with somebody who has gone through the kind of education that is described? in books two through seven no no right so this person then has not given his son because we're, we're sitting here with the this is a patriarchy here in this description here so going from father to son this father he himself was not raised wise he doesn't know what wisdom is right his idea of virtue is making money so the father himself is ignorant of true education. So how could he possibly raise his son to be wise or to value wisdom? And so the son, of course, then is really lacking because he's even questioning his father's level of virtue. And so then we can see that another brood of desires akin to those that were expelled, the unnecessary desires, they're stealthily nurtured. Okay, so some desires, so there's this little battle going on. Some of them got pushed out, but others are growing because there isn't really virtue in the soul. And so then those start to grow strong. Yeah. And they tug and pull back in the same associations and the secret intercourse engendered a multitude. They're growing in number, right? And in the end, he says, they seize the citadel of the young man's soul, finding it empty, right? Because there's no virtue there. So finding it empty and unoccupied by what? By the studies. What are the studies? Book seven. What are the studies? You. Sorry? Is it music and gymnastics? Uh, those were some of the studies, yes. Yeah. Um, we also saw things like the... Oh, sorry. You have an idea? I saw you do that. I can't hear you. Uh, there are five. Just give to Jacob a hint. Hmm. There are five other ones. Book seven. Five studies. Oh, so it's okay. I don't want to put you on the first spot thing, there. It's okay. 
Yeah, there's like arithmetic and geometry and solid geometry, all of those. So those studies. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, honorable pursuits. The Greek here is the same Greek you find at 444e, which would be the end of book four. When you get to, when you put all the virtues together and you see, he, remember he puts them all together and uses the word justice as synonymous with virtue. And he says the way to hold on to these is through honorable pursuits. So living your daily life. So all the things, basically putting it all together, all of these pursuits and pursuing what will allow you to maintain justice in the soul. Those are the honorable pursuits and true discourses. This is really, oh, sorry. sorry. Hmm. This is really hammering the home, the, the necessity for functioning. Yes. You need to be doing beautiful pursuits. It's That's functioning. Right. Mm -hmm. And every time there's a drop, there was an inability for someone to function. Mm -hmm. This oligarchic man couldn't teach, mm -hmm. couldn't function with another person. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good point. The, the mm -hmm. aristocratic man didn't address, didn't function with his wisdom to address mm -hmm. the, the instability. Um, and, and so, yeah, an inability to function with whatever you're learning. Mm -hmm. But also, not only does the inability to actually do it, or, or function with it, cause the decline. Mm -hmm. The influences that 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 are the other people who are doing things are all mm -hmm. negative. Like this person was influenced mm -hmm. by people who like who can uh, sweet talk him and give him the honey of the drones mm -hmm. and stuff. It's these other people that are, which really hammers home the importance for us as philosophers to function on our whatever we learn at all times in our beautiful learnings and pursuits number mm -hmm. one um communicate them use them as best we can to, for others otherwise mm -hmm. problems happen mm -hmm. and in the vacuum of philosophers functioning with what they do all these other negative influences are out there functioning mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, like bringing in the, the democratic soul or mm -hmm. or, 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 or mm -hmm. um attacking um the aristocratic man. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, this that's whole a good section point. is really hammering mm -hmm. on. Yeah, that's a good point. And then maybe just to add to that, remember that the very center of the dialogue is that one paragraph where he says that we need either philosophers to become rulers or rulers to become philosophers. So a very famous line, it's often taken literally that we want our world leaders to be philosophers without knowing what that means to be a philosopher because they have like the Aristotelian image. But of what Plato means, remember we talked about this, it's about being, it's about taking, it's not just being a theorist, but to apply it, right? And so that, I think really, that I think what you said really supports that being the, the center of the dialogue, that that's what for him is most important, that you have to live it. Yeah. And if Socrates yeah. didn't do it, we wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to read it now. That's right. Yeah. And Plato as well, because he wrote it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these studies, honorable pursuits and the true discourses, so dialectic at its various levels, are the best watchmen and guardians in the minds of men who are dear to the gods. Right. And so um, music and gymnastics then also, of course, fit in there as well as honorable pursuits that you've got to keep doing that. Right. And as studies. Um, and the Greek is mm -hmm. the dianoic part of people in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're the best lookouts mm -hmm. and guardians in the dianoia part of people. Oh. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is understanding mm -hmm. of the realm of being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which has to exist for dianoia, mm -hmm. can be integrated in phronesis and should be the object of your focus mm -hmm. for your functioning, mm -hmm. as we've been saying. <laughs> you keep setting off the balloons. <laughs> yes. That's fantastic point. That's, that's right. Um, yeah, so then this person then, um, because they're lacking these um, watchmen and guardians in the soul, the uh, citadel, of their soul is empty and unoccupied because their father could not teach them true education. 
They're lacking all this, and so they return to those lotus eaters and without disguise live openly with them. Do you remember we read that story um, of the reason why you don't want to introduce dialectic too soon? And there was that story of a boy who was maybe kidnapped or adopted, depending on the translation you look at. And when he finds out that the people who raised him are not his true parents, then there are the flatterers who are able to appeal to him. And they question his understanding of beauty and justice and goodness. And they show him that what he believes is not, he can't really defend it. He doesn't necessarily like what they say, but he can't defend his own ideas. And as they start to fall, he starts to really question his own childhood. And he ends up being um, usurped by the flatterers. You can see many parallels here. I can tell you, I have wrote down here. Yeah, it's around 538A. And it goes on for a few pages. So you can look at that later, but it's a really curious, interesting to compare that passage at 538a to this page. And there's a lot of parallels because this person as well questions maybe his own father's um, values, his own father's definition of beauty, justice, and goodness, um, but doesn't have a better answer. And so then is convinced by these lotus eaters and then lives openly with them. And any support comes from his kin to the thrifty element of soul. Those braggart discourses close the gates of the royal fortress within him and refuse admission to the auxiliary force within itself and will not grant, grant audience to its envoy. So this person has been completely, um, has completely shifted to the oligarchic state of mind. And then there's something fun here on page 299. <clears throat> this is the spin on words. And uh, let me give you the Stephanus number here. So we're looking at the end of 560, or D and E, and going into 561. And here we see that um, he's redefining words, right? There's a, a spin being put on it. So what his father might call reverence, he calls folly. And what his father or people wiser than his father might call temperance, he calls that want of manhood. Right? So you can actually, it's, I, one thing I would recommend is actually go through it and make a list and line them up. Um, what society says versus this person's word. And then you can really see the shifting of the values. Okay, so it's not temperance anymore. Now it's want of manhood. Um, and costumely, contumely, I didn't know that word either. Um, it's insulting language. I looked that one up. Um, and rusticity is like um, simple, kind of rough. Um, you know, think of like people living uh, on a ranch or living in a country area, a nice, simple life. Um, but, you know, he throws that away. Um, illiberality, uh, they combine, what does he say here? Um, they teach that moderation and orderly expenditure. Yes, I'm sorry. So moderation is like rusticity. It's like a too rough and poor. And what, you, um, what some people might call orderly expenditure, he calls that uneducated. Um, Again, the harmful appetites take over here. Um, they've emptied and purged all these from the soul. Okay, so now it's like these desires have taken over. It's like, notice this description here. It's not that the person has become different. It's almost like they've been possessed. It's like these desires have taken over the soul of this person. They've emptied and purged of all of, the, all of these from the soul of the youth that they have now possessed and occupied. 
and they're initiating with these magnificent and costly rites. Okay, so this person's been influenced by others. Um, and um, let's see, they lead home from exile, insolence and anarchy, and prodigality or wastefulness and shamelessness. And it's resplendent in its great attendant choir. I like that use of resplendent because we tend to use it to describe like the brilliant light of being. But here it's being used to describe something very unhealthy. Um, and it's crowned with garlands. And in celebration of their praises, they euphemistically call insolence good breeding. And license they call liberty. This is their idea of freedom. They're actually a slave to their desires, right? But they call it freedom. And prodigality or wastefulness, they call magnificence. Shamelessness, they can act in a shameless way and call that being manly. Um, and is it not in some way as this that his youth, that in his youth, the transformation takes place from the restriction to necessary desire? So he started off and his father raised him to only follow what his father sees as necessary desires, that this is the proper way to be, to be socially acceptable, the proper way to live. And he started with that and he threw away all those restrictions and he released his unnecessary and harmful desires. So now he's living free, right? He was repressed before, now he's free. Um, before I go on, any comments on this page up to this point? This is a big one. Double mm. speak, it's called. Mm. Uh, we're harping on on the insistence that there is a realm of being that is understandable mm. in Dianoia, mm -hmm. integrated mm. in phronesis, and you function with it, and you have to function with it. That without that existing mm. principle, mm -hmm. um, what is your grounds to to name things properly? So here you can call temperance not being manly or what we call not being alpha. Mm -hmm. There is no principle. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. So we talked about without there being a principle desire that we seek in philosophy, then all of your desires can run rampant. The mm -hmm. other side of that is naming and understanding without there being a principle of logos mm -hmm. there is no paradigm for understanding anything mm -hmm. can be anything double mm -hmm. speak bravery can be stupidity or or or, or um uh, lecherousness can be alpha or manliness there is no standard anything mm -hmm. is anything in terms of words and mm -hmm. that's what we see now with the political discussion where there'd be like open lying Mm -hmm. And there's no principle that anyone mm -hmm. can point to saying you shouldn't lie. They'll say, they mm -hmm. say, why not? Why can't I lie? Mm -hmm. Why can't I call um, exploitation good? Why can't I mm -hmm. um, just do the say the exact opposite of what your eyes are seeing? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where our world is in. We need that principle not only for mm -hmm. the, the, the true desire we seek, but also as a paradigm for naming things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise... Anything is anything, and then you're just going to be at the whims of whatever mm. comes up, mm. and that's what we're mm. reading about here. It's the right. importance yeah. of mm. naming. Yeah, and in the soul, we want to bring this back to the soul. There's also this idea that if you don't have a principle that you're that's guiding you, then you see it this way. It's not just that you're naming things as you want to. It's that... When you look at moderation, what you see is this rusticity, this um, rugged simplicity. Um, when um, like insolence, um, there's a judgment there, right? And it's based on um, a certain way of seeing the world. But if you see the world differently, then you call that good breeding. Hey, I'm wiser than you. I'm smarter than you. Um, license or you think i'm just uh running free no this is liberty right like we look at this person and say this person is a slave to their desires they're not free at all but this person thinks this is complete freedom so it's not just that it so you're right about the naming and there's a whole dialogue on that right the cratylus on the importance of naming things properly um 
But what we're seeing here is that this person actually does see temperance as a negative thing, a want of manhood. Right. So they're not outright mm -hmm. lying. They mm -hmm. just have a very distorted non-principle that they're seeing That's through. Right. Yeah, we're looking at, yeah, we're, this is being presented not as, we, we can obviously look at our society and apply this to it. And we can see a great deal here. But what we want to do is see this as a state of mind and a state of soul. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we're in it as a state of soul, it's mm -hmm. not that we are lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I could have a little cake because isn't that well, freedom? That is lying we're to not yourself. lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We actually think that is it mm -hmm. is okay to mm -hmm. eat some cake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is also lying to yourself. <laughs> but yes. I see the distinction you're making, yes. Um, so then this person then um, expends money and toil and time no more on his necessary than on his unnecessary pleasures. So, so there's again that idea of equality and that word equal shows up over and over again throughout this. Um, and then there's again the idea of the guardhouse. And we saw that quite a bit on the other page. This ties very much... We're just going to scroll back a bit. Um, ties back to this idea that in the citadel of his soul, um, it's empty and unoccupied. The father did not teach him good education. And now we have this idea of a guardhouse. Right? Remember, we read quite a bit in the early part of the book about the guardians who have to protect the soul and protect the wisdom of the soul. But they turn over the guardhouse of his soul to each desire as it happens along until it's sated. So this person is just jumping from desire to desire. So again, I call this being a slave to your desires, like whatever you want at the moment, that's what you got to have. That's your complete focus. That's what's ruling the soul in that moment. As if it had drawn the lot for that office. <clears throat> and they're all treated equally. Sometimes they do healthy things and sometimes unhealthy things. Um, just a reminder, especially for the millennials watching, that base means bad <laughs> or unvirtuous. Right. Um, so you see here at the end here that sometimes doing healthy things like dieting and drinking only water, other times indulging, and it's all treated as the same. Um, is there anything else worth pointing out here? Yeah, so maybe towards the end here, again, he is a manifold. A manifold man stuffed with the most excellent differences. So quite to the contrast to the person who does not let their soul grow any larger than to be a unity. Jacob, any thoughts? <clears throat> I guess that uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying not to tie it back to trying to look at it from like a soul perspective. Mm -hmm. Many people have, first I'll generalize first, the, the, many people have this idea of living a full life as having many different experiences. Maybe this kind of, all you know, uh, not just being healthy, but also being unhealthy as well, or to just have been healthy might have meant you were missing out on some experience, but that to be unitive in your soul, you would realize that one of them, one of those con relative conditions was actually better and to be content with, mm -hmm. with that uh, experience without having to experience the uh, worse. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, on the mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Many people think that the to truly live is to have many experiences and to have all the ups and downs and the romances and the heartbreak. And yeah, that's true. Right. We hope, though, by the end of our life to find what is 
some idea of wisdom, like the conventional notion of wisdom is the person who's done all of that and comes out the other end with some notion of um, treating people well and so on. But they still want to have had <laughs> that all in their history, right? <laughs> right. Taking all the mm. side quests and never doing mm. the main quest. Mm. That's right. Yes, this is the main quest, what we're doing in this book. And so then we see a real contrast then that Socrates is giving. He does, I think, a very nice job here of really um, describing the state of mind in a way that is fair to the state of mind. You know, but I think that one of the things about the, um, we're calling it sarcasm, the way that he paints it in positive terms, but it also, by doing that, and this is just an idea of mine that I'm just thinking right now, is that um, by doing that, it does kind of honor the state of mind in the sense of presenting it the way that person sees it and showing what they see as the strengths of their state of mind. While at the same time, for those of us who have been following his education all along, and we recognize what is the healthier way, we can see the flaws in that state of mind, even as we're seeing what a person in the democratic state of mind would see as its strengths. And so it's not just giving us a straw man argument of what he's knocking down. I think he's kind of steel manning it and showing its flaws all at the same time. And it's really kind of impressive to see that. And it's just my personal feeling. Yeah. Okay, so that's the democratic state of mind. Um, from next week, then, we'll be going on to looking at the tyrant. Now, we've seen here that each section is getting longer and longer, right? Um, I think the democratic was only like two sections in the book, whereas the democratic here was like four or five sections. And we're going to see that the timocrat, or sorry, that the, um, the tyranny is going to go into book nine, right? It's quite long. So we'll start that then next week to look at the tyrannical state of mind. Okay, um, those of you uh, watching, whether you're watching um, through the live stream or you're watching on my YouTube channel, All About Platonism, I, I thank you for watching. And um, those of you watching on my channel, feel free to leave comments below. I, I would love to see your comments. And um, thank you very much. See you next time. So long.